Hey guys, Jimmy at Freedom Power Washington in South Carolina. I'm getting a booster pump ready to go to a customer today and I wanted to reach out. I've been getting a lot of messages uh, over, over the, uh, the social media channels, people asking me about booster pumps. So what I want to do for you guys is kind of do a quick uh, booster pump 101. I hope this helps a lot of you guys out there that are kind of interested in booster pumps and uh, it, maybe I can throw a little nugget out there for some of you guys that are been running booster pumps for a little bit of time. But uh, anyway, let's. Uh, I'm gonna drop this garage door just so you guys can get better lighting and see. Let's see what we got. So, what uh, what do you think, Ernie? Is that better? Or... Mm -hmm. All right, guys. So let me go put on another light. Uh, get the sunlight. Sorry, it's uh, it's uh, a lot of sun that just comes right in the front of my garage. So what we got here, guys, is we've got a one horsepower Gould's five gallon a minute booster pump. And we can read the letters on here just to show you guys real quick. When you're looking at a booster pump, you've got a five GBS 10. What that means is five gallons a minute Gould's booster stainless. So it's got a stainless diffuser tube and it's got a stainless intake on it as well. On the booster pump, one thing as we go through the parts on this is booster pumps are incredibly, incredibly dependent on having an input check valve. The reason for the input check valve is when you spin up a pump and you start spraying, as soon as you let off the trigger, if you don't have a check valve, all the built up pressure in the line is actually gonna try to back up into the system. So uh, booster pumps are incredibly, incredibly dependent upon a check valve. As we go through, we've got the motor, the check valve, the diffuser, the diffuser tube right here, and then we've got a little T and a T here on the output and the input. And I got to give a shout out to our guy Bill Mavy. He's over there at the Pressure Washers channel, and uh, he turned us on to this T jet unloader valve. And the way this thing works is. If the pressure ever gets high enough, it will actually start diverting fluid back through into the intake. And I'll show you guys where that's really gonna come into play here in a minute. Um, something you see here that's a little bit different, this is a system that I've kind of thrown together. Um, basically, it's an electronics box here, and I've got this thing running on a digital pressure controller. And the purpose of that is I can manually set my pressures um, where I've got a low and I've got a high, and I've got a zero to 300 PSI range in order to do that. And you can see it's protected against the corrosive chemicals by a gauge guard going through push to connects into the front of the T-jet right here. So the digital gauge always defaults into on, and you can put, see I, I use the e-stop also as a switch, so if I need to kick the system on, I just pull this, the system kicks on, hits the pressure that I want it to stop at, and then the system kicks off. So, I also keep the systems, in case guys are running like a, a backup pump and they want to run it next to it, I put this Hubble watertight plug on there. It's only maybe $15 more as an upgrade, but when we're working around a lot of the, uh, the sodium hypochlorite, especially these pumps running 220 or 115, they're both very dangerous, I try to keep it as safe as possible with a watertight plug. You don't have to have this, but... I recommend it if you want to run one gauge system and have a secondary backup pump inside of your box. Um, what I'm doing is I'm feeding the system off of my garden hose pressure. So if I bleed this thing off, you'll see when we started, we had about 55 PSI. That's the pressure coming into my house. What I'm doing is I, I went through the pump today and I was doing a leak check before this thing heads out the door. So, I'll pump. booster while it's spraying. Well, check it out, guys. There's Ernie at Southern Suds. He's holding the camera right now, helping me out today. And I'll tell you guys, make friends with your local pressure washers because they might actually bring, come by and bring you some money every once in a while. So uh, anyway, so I got the booster. It's just hooked up to 50 feet of this Goodyear regular garden hose. And to see it spraying in action, I got one of our little Ryobi Power Care, you know, $10 tips. So to see it, I got to turn it on. 
pump kicks on, and then we'll start doing a little bit of I'm kind of shooting into the wind, but this five gallon a minute booster is throwing. That's not fair. It's, I'm shooting into the wind, but there's no reason why a booster pump can't throw 45 feet all day long. If I come over here and start spraying, you can see we're spraying right up to the peak of the house. So, um, where the T-Jet's gonna come into play is if I were to go from this tip, which is pretty much equivalent to say like a 0040 tip on the inside, um, if I wanted to go from this, let's say I'm in a situation to where I need to spray 6% sodium hypochlorite, but I don't wanna move 6% sodium hypochlorite at five gallons a minute. I could go to like this here, this is a 0075 tip, so seven and a half gallon a minute pressure washer tip. I could put that on board, just like this. And then, when I start spraying, I've got a fine pencil tip. Now something you guys are gonna notice right away, is now my pump is starting to cycle. It's going up to 140 PSI, and then it's shutting the pump off. But the pump is outrunning the orifice of the tip. So what I can do to counteract that is I come on over here, this T-Jet unloader that I've got maxed out, I can start to loosen this, and what that's going to do is allow some of the water to start bypassing back. And that's going to allow me to stop that pump cycling action. Something else we can do on the digital pressure switch is we can also bump the pressures down and work in tandem with this. And that allows us to turn our, our booster pump into a giant 250 and 300 foot pump sprayer. Um, the biggest purpose of that would be if you're on tight spots on a roof and you don't want to throw too much, too much hot sauce on the roof, or if you've got long runs of vinyl fence or something and you don't want to throw 300 gallons of bleach at the fence, you'll be able to, to actually spray that fence with a nice fine mist of a hot mix and get that stuff cleaned up. So, what I'm gonna do is just start spraying here. And we'll start loosening this up. I'm gonna start loosening the T-Jet. And as soon as the pump starts to continuously run, that's my stopping point. So that way, now it's running as it's supposed to. I'm running the smaller pencil tip to greatly reduce how much volume I'm throwing out there onto everything. And then when I'm done, I can shut off and my pump shuts off. And I don't have the cycling effect anymore. Um, booster pumps are great pumps. If I were... Uh, doing a lot of commercial work, I would definitely be running a booster pump. Um, one, of the, one of the two things that you have to keep in mind on a booster pump is, you know, this one's configured at 220 volts. I recommend running two, 220, 230 volts on your booster pump. The motor is going to last a lot longer and run a lot cooler because it's using half the air bridges of 115. If you're running a 7 or a 10 gallon a minute booster pump, you almost need, especially at the one and a half horsepower, you really need to be running 230 volts. The one horsepower motor can run at 115, but you're you're kind of you're really starting to push it at that point. Um, but booster pumps typically do require a generator, um, and they are very check valve dependent. A booster pump cannot prime itself. So what a lot of guys will do is they'll put a little uh, adapter on there, and the only way to get air out of your lines is to actually fill the tube manually with water by forcing water into the system. And as soon as the tube starts pushing the water out through the diffuser plates, it's going to start pulling the air in behind that water. And that's the only real way to actually get a booster pump prime. But understand that you've got to set your system up for that, and a booster pump will not self-prime. Um, one of the big workarounds is guys will run box trucks, and they'll actually put their booster pumps 
underneath the water level of their tank. And by doing that, the water is able to kind of use gravity to start to feed this input port. Um, and then when they, uh, once they have that going, then they may have a three-way valve on top of here. One part of the valve goes straight to the buffer tank for rinsing. The other side of that three-way valve allows them to, to split over and actually pull from a blend manifold. And by pulling from the blend manifold, they can switch back and forth until they get all the lines primed up on the blend manifold. If you're gonna run a booster, I recommend running high flow valves. Um, the half inch GF valves are not really, but you can pull it off, but I guarantee you, you're gonna notice a huge drop in performance and you're actually gonna starve this pump a little bit as well. Um, booster pumps come in three main sizes. There's gonna be a five gallon a minute, a seven gallon a minute, a 10 gallon a minute booster pump. When you're looking at the charts on the booster pumps, you're going to see the five gallon a minute comes at three quarter horse, one horse up to one and a half horse, and then seven gallon a minute starts at like one horse, one and a half, two, ten gallon a minute goes from one and a half, two to two and a half horsepower. The only difference in that is what kind of pressures do you want to, the booster pump to operate at. Um, booster pumps by default start with a max operating with a low horsepower motor, depending on the, the, the booster tube itself. The diffuser tube, um, they're going to start operating at 130 PSI, and then they can go up to 190 PSI, and then they can go all the way up to 270 PSI. But the horsepower rating of the motor is going to depend on what pressure the booster pump is capable of. One thing I've noticed in running these things is uh, typically your head pressure on whatever orifice that you're spraying, the happiest place I've seen to run at is anywhere from 130 to 150 PSI. I've pushed these things up past 170, 180, and honestly, you're not getting any more distance, you're not getting any more volume. In fact, it starts working against you. All you're really doing at that point is putting more atomization into the air. And by putting more atomization into the air, you're just wasting chemical at that point. Um, when you're looking at a big project, the name of the game that's going to out clean a large project is going to be volume over pressure, especially when we're doing the soft wash type of environment and uh, we're using a lot of the chemicals to work for us. Now, don't get me wrong, there's going to be small areas to where, you know, you really want to get in there with a good hit of pressure to knock, you know, like, like, like little things off like uh, moth eggs or, or moss or lichens or some of the stuff that that really wants to stick. But when you're looking at the big picture of an overall job, volume is gonna drop pressure in your cleaning. Um, outside of that, um, on the five gallon a minute booster, you can get away with doing your plumbing at a three quarter inch line. But if you go up to a seven or a 10 gallon, absolutely take everything to a full one inch to capitalize on that full volume that those booster pumps can throw. Um, I followed the manual here. What I did was I, uh, I went with all stainless fittings on the input line here, and I did stainless on the output line. And what I did by doing that, that's what the manual actually recommends to do. But at the same token, as you're in the middle of July, and this thing's running on a truck, and maybe there's a pressure washer running, it's 95 degrees outside, um, the booster pump will actually warm up, especially as you work. The motor's going to warm up. It's going to warm up user tube area and then what's going to happen is with all the poly fittings all these poly fittings they have you know a great pressure rating at room temperature but when you look at the charts and you start warming these things up let's say you're getting into 120 130 140 degrees out in the, out in the hot sun what's going to happen is you're going to see those performance charts start to drastically drop so by doing the metal input fittings as the manufacturer says this actually acts as a little bit of a heat sink and a barrier before you start to transition into your poly fittings and help give you a better chance of having cracks and breaks and, and having blow ups on the poly fittings. Um, keep in mind guys, whenever you start getting into these bigger high performance pumps, um, you're running at twice the pressure as like say you're running an Everflow or a North Star pump and the small 12 volt DC pumps. And what that what that means is you've got to pay more attention to the types of fittings that you're running, the types of hoses that you're running, whether or not they can handle those types of pressures. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself out there uh, having blowouts, and you're going to be getting frustrated with, uh, with some of the equipment that you're trying to run. So, 
this is actually a non kink hose and you can see I stretched the hose nice and tight on here but just the sheer pressure has actually puffed this hose out a little bit so what I'm going to end up doing this hose is rated for the types of pressure but because it's going to puff up I'm actually going to ship this thing out with the secondary hose just in case this thing does create an issue um, the customer is going to have that secondary option as well so uh, you can just see how much pressure it's dealing with on the hose already so uh, anyway uh, so that's the uh, that's the booster pump that's kind of a quick nutshell as to how they operate um, I hope this is helping you guys out there but uh, uh, or if any of you guys have been running boosters for a long time uh, I've got this control system that I developed I've got a couple buddies out there running it they love it it's been bulletproof for them um, outside of this digital system another popular one is going to be the pro switch the pro switch mounts on the booster pump as well it's a good option it's a mechanically operated option so what that means is that you have to set a low and a high a high pressure switch like the, the where the pump kicks on and where the pump turns off you have to set those via screws and that's been that's been a pretty solid design that's been around since pumps were developed you know years and years ago um, it's popular with with uh, well water applications or not soft wash applications so uh, anyway guys I hope that helps and uh, for all you guys out there uh, getting ready for the spring uh, Keep those trucks rocking and the bubbles popping. You guys have a great day.